My name is Michelle Denault, but I never get my own identity because I am married to a superintendent of schools. So everyone always knows me as Mr. Denault's wife. And what's kind of cool is ever since this has kind of exploded for me and I've been doing a lot of speaking at schools in Chicago, my husband will text me and he'll say, I'm so proud to be Michelle's husband. And I love the flip of that dynamic. So I never get my own identity because of that and because I'm a mom. I mean, anybody who's a mom never gets their own identity. But if you look me up on the web, you can find me under Forbes versus New Berlin School District and Carol Owen Smith. I was sexually abused by one of my teachers when I was in high school. And I'm gonna weave my story in and out of this presentation. And for some people that can be quite heavy and quite triggering to listen to. When I do this talk for students, I tell them, you do not have to be a survivor of sexual violence to struggle with this talk. If you can't read Old Yeller, this may not be the talk for you. And it's okay if you need to walk away from it. I also do talk about a car accident. So I wanna give that trigger warning as well. I have dedicated this to numerous people, but today I wanna to dedicate it to my dad. When my parents were 16 years old, my mom gave my dad sex for his 16th birthday. And voila, here I came nine months later. I'm happy to report that they've been married 53 years. They stuck it out and they seem to still really like each other. My dad also only has one hand. His other hand was blown off in a gun accident when he was 14 years old. His job, wallpaper hanger and painter. He literally was a one-armed paper hanger. Survivor parents take on a lot of guilt. What could they have done? What should they have done? What did they miss? They take on a lot from society. Why didn't they do more? Why didn't they see more? And in 2010, my dad had a brain aneurysm. And because of the surgery that went with that brain aneurysm, he has the early onset of dementia from all the scar tissue. And sometimes he doesn't even know who I am. The other day he looked at me and said, hey, Michelle, what's your middle name? And I said, Lynn. And he goes, thank God you remembered because I forgot. He doesn't even recognize me sometimes. And I didn't file my litigation until 2018. So my dad really hasn't gotten to see me rise. And I wanna dedicate this to him today because I know he would be really, really proud of me right now. And I want people to understand that even though you see a 52 year old assertive woman standing before you today, I am somebody's daughter. And I was just a child when this happened. So before we get too super serious, I wanna start with something funny. I was a New Berlin pretzel. Most people have no idea what that is, especially where I'm from in Southern Illinois. That was my mascot. I was a pretzel. I'm not making that up. Salt and bread. Hey, that's what we said. We are the pretzels. We had a guy that ran around in a giant pretzel head and we could even make pretzels with our fingers. So everybody, I know I can't see you do this, but I gotta do it. Put your two middle fingers in the air. You're not gonna get in trouble for it. When I do this with the staff, they love it because I tell them there's somebody you're angry at right now. It's a good sign. Cross your two middle fingers, put your two pointer fingers on top of those, and now you got a pretzel. I got kids making pretzel gang signs all over Southern Illinois, and I love it. And I loved being a pretzel. It was unique. My favorite cheer that we did was, if you think you can beat us, then take a big bite. And how much I loved it will be really important at the end. I'm gonna start this with a car commercial and it will make sense. She's gonna share her screen so you can see it. When I put this presentation together, I told my husband I wanted to start with something that would get everybody in the guts and they would think to themselves, what if that was my kid? 
And I remember watching that commercial in 2012 when I had kids just getting ready to drive. And I remember thinking, what if that's my kid? And I looked up the statistics of that. And in 2012, it was right about 6,000 kids that died in car accidents. But in 2019, that changed to 2,400 kids. And why was that? We started having those conversations with our kids, started talking to them about texting and driving and drinking and driving, started making those parent contacts. And there's a lot of things that we are really comfortable talking to our kids about, but sexual abuse and sexual assault is not one of them. We're comfortable talking to our kids about active shootings. From the time they're five, we teach them how to hide in their building from a shooter. And frankly, it's quite mortifying to them. Your odds of being killed in a school shooting are around one in two million. But on any given day, it could happen at your school. And we don't mind scaring our kids a little if we think it will keep them safe. We don't mind talking to them about texting and driving and drinking and driving, having those conversations. In some places, we're so comfortable, we put on mock accidents. And in New Berlin, they put one of those on before prom in 2017. It was May 5th. I was their booster president. I was there. And they brought in the crashed up cars and the helicopters and the ambulances. And they put fake blood across the kids. And they laid the kids across the ground and across the cars. And the deputy county coroner of Sangamon County stood up and said, I don't want to come back here on Sunday and find out we're missing a kid. Do not drink and drive on prom night. The next day was May 6, 2017, and it was prom. And this was my son, Johnny's friend, Maddie. And Maddie said to Johnny, she said, Johnny Forbes, you better not be going out and drinking and driving on prom night. Come to the school after prom with me. You can stay there all night and play games with your friends. You don't have to worry about losing your sports or getting in trouble. But my Johnny was a senior. His sports were done. He didn't care about that. So like a goober, he went out and he partied on prom night. And I'm grateful to say he's still here. But his friend Maddie, she did all the right things. She went to the schools after prom. She stayed there all night till 5.30 in the morning. Her best friend's mom picked them up, took them back to the house. She slept for a couple hours, got up, had a little something to eat, got in her car. And in the early morning hours of May the 7th, 2017, Maddie Finch fell asleep at the wheel and went into the oncoming lane of traffic. The deputy county coroner that gave that speech was Maddie's stepdad. Maddie Finch taught me a lot of things. New Berlin's a really small school. She was one of my kiddos, and I wasn't in a good place when she died. I'd just spoken up about being abused in my district and it was not being received well. Everybody was calling me all the things they'd always called me. There was a lot of suicidal thoughts going on. I really didn't want to live anymore. And the day she died, I went up to my concession stand and I sat there and I thought about everything this 16 year old kid just taught me in one singular moment. Always be yourself. Maddie Finch was always herself. She didn't care what anybody thought about her. In fact, she was a little bit of a rebel. She would be the kid that you'd have to open the door of your classroom and lean out and go, Maddie, we don't talk like that in the school hall. She was a little bit of a rebel, but she was always herself and that would become her legacy. She taught me about perspective. I was 46 when she died. And I remember sitting there and thinking to myself, wow, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me, but I've had 46 years of 365 days in each year to fall down, but to get back up again, to get my heart broken, but to fall in love again to get to be a mom and a wife and live my dreams and learn my purpose. She was never going to get to do that. So when I do this talk for students, I tell them, it doesn't matter if you're up here feeling on top of the world about your life today, or if you're down here feeling really crummy. And trust me, down here's coming because that's just life. But when you get down here, if there's road ahead of you to walk, get up and keep walking. Don't ever give up on yourself. Some people don't get that opportunity. She also taught me that sometimes we can do all the right things and not get the right result, right? She did all the right things. And when it comes to sexual abuse and sexual assault, you will often hear people say this, what were you wearing? Did you say no? Did you want it? But when it comes to sexual abuse and sexual assault, you have never done anything wrong. There are absolutely times in this life you can do all the right things and not get the right result. And lastly, she taught me that frankly, sometimes we miss the little things. We thought we had all our bases covered that night with our kids. 
who didn't think about a kid being up all night at a school event and falling asleep at the wheel. And we've missed a lot when it comes to our kids with sexual abuse and sexual assault. I told you that your odds of being killed in a school shooting are around one in two million. But every 68 seconds, somebody is sexually assaulted. And every nine minutes, that someone is a child. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused or assaulted before they turn the age of 18. This is not a girl thing. In fact, they think those numbers are closer, but boys are less likely to report. 66% of all sexually abused kids are between 12 and 18. When you hear the word molestation, you think of little people, but it's this age group that's at the highest risk. And why is that? Ease of access. They're away from their parents more. It's a natural progression. Nobody sends their kid to church camp or band camp thinking the person in charge of their child is going to hurt them. Less time for the crime. I was on a conference call one day with somebody who worked with predators in prison, and they said, oh, most of them will tell you they'd like to abuse your littles, but they choose this age group specifically because they get less time in prison if their victim is 13 or over. And lastly, at this age, society tends to blame the victim. I'm sure we've all seen or possibly even done a little bit of victim blaming in our lifetime, and that's gonna be a huge part of this talk. How many of you out there told your kids not to talk to strangers? I'm sure every single one of you, but 93% of the time, the victim will know and trust the assailant. 93% of the time. Only 7% are strangers, 34% are family, 59% are their acquaintances, their teachers, their coaches, their youth leaders, their pastors, that family friend that they've been taught that they can trust. And only 25 of every 1,000 perpetrators will ever end up in jail. I entitled this, Abusers Don't Care. I will wrap that in at the end. One in 10 kids K through 12 will be abused by a teacher. That is from a study done for the US Department of Education. The average age of the teacher offender is 36. The average age of the student is 15. On average, a predatory teacher will be on their third school before they're ever caught. We call that passing the trash. If never caught, the average abuser over all areas can have up to 75 victims in their lifetime. Over a thousand children that we know of were abused in the Pennsylvania diocese alone. 100,000 Boy Scouts filed for compensation claims in 2020 for sex abuse. And Dr. Larry Nassar has 501 known victims. You see, abusers don't care if you teach your kids how to trust and respect their teachers. They're hoping you do because some people have used that trust to abuse kids. And they don't care if you take your kids to church and give them morals and values. They're hoping you do because some people have used God to abuse kids. And they don't care if you teach your kids how to go for the gold or how to have great big goals. They're hoping you do because some people have used that drive to abuse children. And they don't even care if you tell your kids that it's okay for their doctors to touch their private parts because that's how Dr. Nassar abused 501 girls. I put these in here so people would understand, even if you're not a survivor, this costs you. 86% of all women in prison have been sexually abused or assaulted at some time in their life. Even more astonishing is that 67% of women who are raped in prison are raped by somebody who works for the prison in a position of authority. You see those women lost their voices a long time ago. Nobody cares what they have to say, so they just keep getting abused by authority. I looked those up for men the other day and it said one in 20 men in prison has been sexually abused and one in 10 men in prison was physically abused as a child. That's huge, that touches us all. 33% of women who are raped contemplate suicide. I am in that 33%. I was on suicide watch just three years ago from the stress of my litigation. 13% of women who are raped attempt suicide. Survivors of assault are three times more likely to use marijuana, six times more likely to use cocaine, and 10 times more likely to use all major drugs. We say that marijuana is the gateway drug. No, trauma 
is the gateway drug. And 79% of those survivors victimized by that family member, that close friend, that acquaintance, will suffer severe to moderate distress issues throughout their life, struggle to hold a job, drop out of school, struggle to form normal relationships. Even if you're not a survivor, this costs you. So who pays for that? LA Unified School District paid out $25 million in January of 2020 after paying out 88 million and that case dwarfed the 200 million they paid out for one abusive teacher named Mark Burt. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars. As of December, 2016, the Pennsylvania Diocese had offered to pay out $84 million. The Catholic Church has paid out $3 billion in sex abuse claims. That's a lot of tithe money. The Boy Scouts of America just approved $813 million. They thought they'd cap out at a billion, they're now looking at 1.5 or 2 billion in sex abuse claims. That's a lot of popcorn to sell. Michigan State agreed to pay $500 million to 332 victims of Dr. Nassar. They just settled another one of those about six months ago in the hundreds of millions. And $187 billion is spent each year in this country on mental health costs. If we were proactive instead of reactive, we could change some of that. This is my last statistic, and it goes to the heart of this talk. It's estimated that 22,000 soldiers are raped in the US military every year, and every day 22 soldiers die by suicide, but only 12 of them from the PTSD of combat. The Department of Veterans Affairs on their own website has acknowledged that the PTSD of being sexually assaulted in the military is worse than the PTSD of combat. You see those people trusted their fellow officers. They believed in them. They were willing to die for them. And they loved the country they were serving and the branch of service they were serving. And when that is violated and betrayed and you're not allowed access to a justice system to save an institution or somebody's buddy they drink with on Friday night, that carries worse PTSD than being in combat. You just saw all those places where children were abused, where they were supposed to be able to trust people the most. We have a world of people walking around in the war zone and they've never even picked up a gun. This is Grooming 101. Grooming is a pattern behavior designed to increase opportunity, minimize victim resistance and withdrawal and reduce disclosure and belief. And when I say belief, I mean by the victim. Most of the time, they do not understand what is happening to them. As a survivor of abuse, I know the symbiotic feed well. <laughs> you love the abuser, so it empowers them to abuse you. It justifies it in the eyes of everybody, in the eyes of the abuser, in the eyes of the abused, and in the eyes of society. How many of you out there read about Gabby Petito that was killed by her boyfriend a few years ago? When Gabby Petito is crying and taking responsibility for her own abuse on that video, and Brian Laundrie's talking to the police. Very calmly, I might add. And he tells them she's what? She's crazy. And they drove away and they left her there. And I can guarantee you that even if she hadn't died, some of us would be sharing that video virally still. And we'd be calling her crazy because that's what grooming and society have taught us to do when it comes to abuse. Your typical grooming model works around fear. It talks about the abuser making the child afraid. If you tell, I'll kill your parents. If you tell, I'll kill you. But when an abuser is grooming a child into a love relationship, they are not using fear. They are using love. They are threatening to emotionally blackmail that child and withdraw that affection. These children are often not afraid of them. They truly think they are in love relationships, especially your teens and preteens. They think this is a boyfriend, girlfriend situation. That is why it's so important for adults, like I said, to step in and help this child. These are the steps of grooming. That's me when I was five. Wasn't I cute with my pigtails? It'll be important later. Target the victim, gain the target's trust, play a role in the victim's life, isolate the victim, create a secret relationship. It takes them a lot to get to sexual contact. They have to work really hard. And then there's control. I put this together because I sat through a body boundaries in a pre-K class. 
I listened to them tell kids what good touches were. Hugs, fist bumps, pats on the back, and bad touches were hitting and kicking and biting. And if somebody's doing something bad to you, you'll feel uncomfortable. My abuser never hit me, never kicked me. Sure gave me a lot of hugs, got a lot of pats on the back, made me feel really special. I did not miss steps one through three. Step four is just absolutely where the magic happens. So I wanna show you this before I start with step one. A couple of years ago, back in my home school district, there was another alleged abuser back in the hall. I'd gotten several calls and emails about him. So I called back and I asked people from 15 to 50. So tell me about Mr. So-and-so, what do you think about him? Is he a good teacher? And they all said the same thing. I assume you're asking me that because he's having sex with, and they named the student. And then they said this about him. You know, he's popular. <laughs> all the girls like him. They all seek out his attention. He is so good with our students. Did you know he was SIU Student Teacher of the Year? And then they said this about her. You know, she's a flood. Do you know how many boys she's had sex with? She's a known drama queen. She brings him Starbucks every day. She's seeking his attention. She wants it. Eight months later, that teacher was walked out of that building for allegedly watching 12-year-old girls get undressed in the locker room. But he had eight more months to work in that district because of what we don't see at steps one through three and what we choose to see when we get to step four. Step one, target the victim. There is no one singular trait in every victim. There's just not. This happens to good kids. This happens to bad kids. And I don't think we got bad kids. We've been breaking it down to that since the days of the movie Grease, haven't we? We have the Sandra D's and the Rizzo's, right? And it doesn't matter if you're filthy with virginity like Sandra D or if you're taking a pregnancy test in the school bathroom like Rizzo, every single kid's a target. Everyone, jocks, brains, artists. They do try to pick the target with the lowest potential for exposure. But what we fail to understand is lowest potential for exposure could just be the kid who's hanging out with that coach all the time because they're trying to throw the discus a little bit further. Or that kid who's really getting into their faith so they're hanging out with that youth pastor all the time. Lowest potential for exposure doesn't have to have anything to do with good kids and bad kids or good parents and bad parents. They do often groom the adults around them. We all remember Bill Cosby, right? Bill Cosby was able to groom an entire nation into thinking he was the father of TV. And he was able to rape 60 women that way, that we know of. You see, I have the name Kyle Stevens here. She was one of Dr. Nassar's victims. She wasn't a gymnast. She was six. Her dad was a doctor. And she told her dad that Dr. Nassar was touching her and making her feel bad. And her dad told her there was no way that Dr. Nassar would ever do that. And her dad made her apologize to Dr. Nassar. As I said, they often groom all of the adults around them. They are the, your teacher of the year, Hall of Fame coach, the most popular person in your community. That is absolutely how they get away with this. This always starts with an interview process and they don't just interview one kid. They interview a lot of kids because they're looking for a particular response to pick their ultimate victim. And it starts off very basic, like you've got a great smile. God, you just light up my day when you come into church. And when I do this for kids, I say, is that always grooming? Absolutely not. Some people just care about you. I ask them, is gift giving always grooming? Absolutely not. Some people just care about you. But I tell them that predators will start to push the edge of the envelope. They are looking to desensitize that child. They'll start saying things like, my gosh, you are so much more mature than your peers. Are you sure you're not older than you say you are? They just keep pushing it, waiting for that response. My abuser came up to my locker and asked me if I was wearing anything under my dress. And then he would tell me that he would sit me in the front of his class so he could look at my pretty legs, pushing it, trying to desensitize the child, waiting for that response. Step two is to gain the victim's trust. I thought for a really long time, what did he do that made me trust him so much? What did he say? And then I realized he didn't have to do anything at all. 
just by the nature of who he was. What do we tell our kids they can do with their teachers? They can trust them. We teach our kids to trust, respect, and obey their teachers, their coaches, clergy, youth leaders, military officials, law enforcement. We teach our kids to trust and respect titles, not people. And what I find fascinating is we tell our kids that trust is earned, but we just expect them to give it blindly to anybody who has a title. And unfortunately, that can be very dangerous because some really bad people can step into the shoes of some very honorable titles and they become the stranger beside everybody so they can abuse kids. This is me when I was in fourth grade. I loved my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Lovecamp. I wanted to be a teacher because of her. I would play school all the time and pretend I was her and I would have never been disrespectful to her. That was the 70s, man. I'd have been in big trouble if I'd have been disrespectful to one of my teachers. I could have used anybody's picture for this slide. We have plenty of them out there in the media, right? Plenty of famous people. But I wanted to use my abuser's picture. I wanted to use it to show you how strong that pull is to continue to honor somebody even when they've been implicated in something heinous. These pictures were taken after he was implicated in child sex abuse. My litigation was on the front page of the Springfield, Illinois paper. And here he is giving speeches and wearing his medals and getting to remain the 57th chief devil dog of the United States Marine Corps Auxiliary. I've been litigating for six years. And just two years ago, he was handing a check over to the children's hospital in his Marine Corps outfit. These people pick these positions of honor because they know it will be hard for people to see them in the light that's being shed on them. As I said, your teens are at a particularly high risk here, 66%. They are at a pivotal point of emotional development. How many of you have looked at your kids or if there's any teachers out there, looked at your students and gone, what were you thinking? They're not thinking, they're feeling. We know that. They have a natural want for love and a normal sexual curiosity, and there's nothing wrong with them. But these people come along and they exploit that. And we've taught our kids that these people's intentions are always good. Predators act like your child's adult best friend. I get this one all the time, all the time. My kid would never, they would never. Don't you bring my kid in on this. I've raised my kid better than that. I've given them morals and values. I have Life360 on their phone. I check their texts. I volunteer at their school. I'm a good parent. Well, I've got news for you. If you're a good parent, you're probably not letting your kids do all the things that normal kids wanna do. And half the time, your kids probably think you're an idiot, don't they? I mean, how many times a week do your kids roll their eyes at you? Did your parents know everything you did when you were a kid? No, I'm sure not. And you don't know everything your kids are doing. It looks more like this. It's Christmas, you're 40 years old, you walk in, you go, hey mom, let me tell you about that time when I was 15 that my brother and I, that's what it looks like. And predators know this. And they come in and they become your child's adult best friend. They can allow them to do all the things that normal kids want to do. It could be something as simple as listening to a genre of music you won't let them listen to, or going to a movie you won't let them see, smoking, drinking, all the things they have access to. I had a friend that wanted to go into the city and see the Cleveland Indians play, and her parents wouldn't take her, so her teacher did. And he got her drunk, and he got her high, and he sexually assaulted her. She put him in prison a couple of years ago when she was in her 40s. I was really proud of her for that. Step three is to play a role in the victim's life. You could be the kid, like I said, who's just trying to throw the discus a little further so you're hanging out with that coach more. Or you could be the kid whose parents are getting divorced. So you just need somebody to talk to. Or you could be the kid that just doesn't feel that great about herself. My mother did that to my hair. I need you all to understand I turned 52 last year and I am never going to forgive my mother for doing that to my hair. She gave me that poodle perm. My teeth weren't together yet. I thought I was chubby. 
clearly I'm not a snappy dresser. I'm wearing a smurf shirt in this picture. And he came along and he made me feel really special. And he never treated me like a kid, ever. He always told me that I was like no woman he'd ever known. But I was only 14 and he was 25 years older than me. That's a great catch you made at the game the other night. If you're still struggling with your pitch, why don't you stay after and I'll help you with that? Just you and me. You killed it on that math test. If you're still struggling with fractions, why don't you drop by the house later? I'll tutor you. Just you and me. It's really that simple. I saw you crying in the hall. I'm sorry you didn't make the team. Why don't you come to my office every day and you could be my personal secretary? That was mine. I hadn't made the cheerleading squad. So he offered to let me be his personal secretary. He was the most popular teacher in the hall, the football coach. Everyone wanted his attention and he was giving it to me. He even wrote that in my yearbook. Here's hoping my secretary has as much fun on her educational endeavors as I've had on mine. The first time I read this slide, I choked on it. Playing the role of best friend and confidant is your abuser. He was my best friend for a really long time. Anybody out there, when I do this for a staff, I ask the staff, anybody out there have somebody here they can go to after this is over and go, can you believe they made us watch that for professional development today? And people are always pointing at each other and smiling. And I tell them, this creates intimacy. And we have taught our kids that intimacy is sex, but it's not. It's a bond. It's a friendship. It's being able to go to somebody with your deepest, darkest secrets and all your crap. And teenagers got a lot of crap. And thinking you can tell them anything and they'll listen to you and they won't betray you. And these people come in and they create that bond with our kids. And they do it using all the things that we've taught our kids are good. Love, care, kindness, concern. And there's nothing at all that feels uncomfortable about that. Remember me in that first- Are you able to stay to your left? Move to my left? Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yes, that's perfect, sorry. Okay. No, you're fine. Remember me in that first picture, I was in that pink shirt. That's when grooming began. I'm a freshman in that picture. This is right before my sophomore year. I'm 15 in this picture. I feel really special at this point. I'm his personal secretary. He's my best friend, my confidant. I can go to him for anything. I've only kissed three boys, so that knocks out the slut theory, even though that's what they called me. And I was in love with him. I was, and I was about to hit step four. Step four is isolating the victim. This is where the magic happens. This is why Gabby Petito was crying on that video and taking responsibility for her own abuse. Because at this stage, the victim needs the abuser. They need them. It is their only source of care and concern. They've been isolated to them. You think I was hanging out with my friends anymore? No. Think I was going and talking to my parents about stuff? No. I was going to him for everything. I liked being with him. I wanted to be with him. I didn't think he was hurting me. And my peers saw that. And the other teachers in the hall saw that. And they made me out to be the problem, called me the aggressor. What do you call that kid that's getting a little special attention from that teacher or coach? The teacher's pet. You put it back on the kid. And sometimes that can be the plan of a predator. They are trying to create an identity for that child to protect themselves. Poor, drama queen, homewrecker, liar. My peers bullied me terribly. They really did. And I'd love to think that 100% of adults who are working with children are looking out for the best interests of children. I would, I'm married to a school administrator. And I believe that 99% of the people working with children are looking out for the best interest of children. But I didn't have that luxury. My guidance counselor came up to my locker and told me I needed to be quiet and quit crying because I was ruining a man's career. My cheerleading coach said to my mom, have you seen how she dresses? It's like dangling meat in front of a dog. I was getting bullied from all sides, even from my safe adults. I didn't know 
where to go or why I even needed to go somewhere. So where did I go? I went to him. I didn't think he was the problem. I thought they were the problem. I thought they were all just jealous because I was getting all of his attention and they weren't. They just, they just don't understand us. They'll never understand how much you mean to me. I would never hurt you. I'm a teacher. He said that. And I had been taught that I could trust that. Step five is to create a secret relationship. At this stage, the abuser makes the victim responsible for keeping that secret. <laughs> you wanted this. You asked for this. You come see me all the time. I thought you were mature enough for this relationship. He said that to me. Do you want to see me lose my job and be pumping gas for the rest of my life? How do you think my family's going to feel? And he never told me he was hurting me. And he never told me he was committing a crime. In fact, 15 was my first sexual contact. But he waited until my 17th birthday to have sex with me. And it was on my birthday. So my birthday will forever be a trigger in my trauma. He did that because 17 is the age of consent in Illinois. So he was able to convince me that he hadn't committed a crime. Instead, he pulled a book off of a shelf and told me there was a word called moral turpitude and that he could lose his job according to his teacher's contract for being unethical because he was having an extramarital affair. And that's why I needed to keep our secret. I would have taken a bullet for my abuser. I would have. I loved him. And I could put all 4.5 million educator abuse survivors in this room and they would tell you the same thing. They loved their abusers and they thought their abusers loved them. Step six is to initiate sexual contact. It takes them a long time to get here. They have to target that victim, gain their trust, play a role in their life, isolate them, create that secret relationship. That is me when grooming began, when I'm a freshman at 14. This is my senior picture. You probably can't see it close enough to notice the difference in my eyes in that picture. But that is a sexualized kid. By the time that picture was taken, my abuser had been having sex with me for over a year, almost every day, multiple times a day, inside the school building. That is a kid who had her innocence stolen by the person she was told she should be able to trust the most. And the people who were supposed to be protecting her or blaming her. And no kid should ever have to go through that. And as we speak, there are kids living with this in their churches, in their schools, in their athletic venues, and they have no idea what's happening to them or how to get out of it. Sexual contact is always a slow burn. These are adults trying to have sex with kids. And I know we call them young adults, but no, they're kids. It starts with those good touches. They have to make it look awkward that hug, that pat on the back, and then it moves to the hand on the leg, a kiss, a reach up the skirt was my first sexual contact at 15. When you hear the word abuse, you think of fear, don't you? And violence and yelling and hitting. And when you hear the word rape, you think of somebody who doesn't give what? Consent, but not everybody abuses with fear. Some people abuse with love and not everybody rapes with force. Some people can manipulate a kid into consenting to their own sexual violation. So then they can blame them because they consented and the rest of society tends to blame them too. Step seven is control. This is a push-pull phase. It is so confusing for the victim. It's what really instills that long-term silence. I can put myself in this moment. I would wait for him every day after driver's ed. And one day he pulled in, he knew I was there, but he got in his truck and he left. And I went home and I cried all night. I mean, I couldn't just call him all night. What had I done? What had I said? Is there somebody else? And the next day he came in, he said, oh no, I, I can't imagine my life without you. I just needed to get home. But other days he'd say, I didn't have to choose you. I could have chosen any girl in the school. If you can't keep your mouth shut, I'm gonna to have to leave you. I didn't wanna lose him for anything in the world. He was my first love. And when I do this talk for students, that gets them right in the gut because they are sitting in that moment 
of their first love. At this point, I usually ask my audience how old they think I was when I finally figured out I've been abused and not loved. And the typical first response is age 25. And I love when they fall into my hands with age 25 because they think that's when your brain develops, so that's when you should figure it out. But if you know anything about trauma, that's just not the way it works. What is woven into you as a child can become your compass. And everyone normalized this for me. They made it seem like a normal situation that they only blamed me because he was married. I went for a very long time thinking that I'd been in a love relationship with somebody, that he had been my first love. I was 44 when I finally figured out I'd been abused and not loved. The average age for understanding and speaking up when you've been groomed and abused by an authority figure is age 50. That's why there's no more statute of limitations in my state of Illinois, because we figured out that these kids were having no idea what had happened to them. Even survivors of priest abuse thought that they had done that for the goodness of God and the goodness of the church. They had no idea what had really happened to them. I'm gonna show you a document here in a second. But before I do that, after this is over, I want everybody to Google the words teacher, sexual, and hit your news tab. I usually have my live audience do that while we're talking. And when I did this talk at Oakville, I said, let me guess, one hour ago. And their superintendent said, no, Michelle, one minute ago. Those are the news articles you'll find of teachers implicated in abusing students. It's really quite astonishing when you look. And you can go home and change it to coach or pastor, and you're going to get the same result. But if you look through these articles, you will see it called an inappropriate relationship. But it is not that. It's abuse. Because adults are not legally allowed to have sex with kids, and they should not want to have sex with kids. But we've bought into it being called an inappropriate relationship because that's what we're more comfortable with. Because like I said, we're not ready to see these people we honor in the light that's being shed on them. I'm gonna show you a document. I told you a thousand children that we know of were abused in the Pennsylvania diocese. This prompted a grand jury investigation and the FBI came in and got the documents from the church. Up until this point, only the bishop had had a key. This is a public document. You can look it up online and read it. The FBI said that it was like a playbook for abusing children when they read the documents. They said that this is how the Catholic church treated abuse claims. First, Make sure to use euphemisms rather than real words in the diocese documents. Never say rape. Always say inappropriate contact or boundary issues. Second, don't conduct genuine investigations with properly trained personnel. Instead, assign fellow clergy members to ask inadequate questions and then make credibility determinations about the colleagues with whom they live and work. Third, for the appearance of integrity, Send the priest for an evaluation at a church-run psychiatric clinic. Allow these experts to diagnose whether the priest is a pedophile based largely on the priest's own reporting. Fourth, when a priest does have to be removed, don't say why. Say he's suffering from nervous exhaustion or he's on sick leave or say nothing at all. Fifth, even if priests are found to be raping children, they still provided them with housing and living expenses. Sixth, if a predator's conduct becomes known to the community, don't remove him from the priesthood to ensure that no other children will be hurt. Instead, pass him on to another church where no one will know what he's done. Passing the trash. It's done at schools. It's done at churches. It's done in athletic venues. Finally, and above all, don't tell the police. Child sex abuse is a crime, but don't treat it that way. Keep it in house like a personnel issue. This is what the FBI found when they went through the documents of the Catholic Church on how to deal with a claim that a child had been abused in their care. That should scare everyone watching this right now. So why do we have to start this conversation? What's the tragedy that most of you have probably never had a talk like this before? What's the tragedy that some of you on here may have had a very different definition of grooming thanks to social media this last year. What's the tragedy that the numbers aren't changing and that we still don't wanna talk about sexual violence? That's me when I was five. That's my kindergarten picture. 
And that's a little girl that I used to work with at Bethel grade school. She's one of 12 children. And I'm not saying she's not loved, but that's a lot of love to go around, isn't it? She came up to me one day on the playground. She goes, Miss Michelle, I am hungry. And that's exactly how she talked. She was a very bold young lady. And I said, well, girl, you got about five more minutes and we're gonna go to lunch. She sat down on the bench next to me. She put her head on my shoulder. And she said, Miss Michelle, I sure do love you. And I cried. What a tragedy. She trusted me to tell me that. What a tragedy that anybody would ever violate that trust or that anybody would blame her for that violation. This is what I need to understand as a survivor. I need to understand this. When do these little girls become sacrificable? Because when they come in our schools at the age of five with their backpacks on, they're our babies. So at what point do these little girls become sacrificable? for a wallet or an image or somebody's buddy they drink with on Friday night. If you are a mandated reporter, you are mandated to report suspected child abuse, not proven, suspected. And this is not popular, but you are not mandated to go to your supervisor. You are mandated to pick up the phone and call the hotline. It is your legal and quite frankly, your moral obligation. If you're comfortable going to your supervisor after you make that call, that is perfectly fine. But make that call first. When you don't, that is how trash gets passed. I thought for a really long time how to tell you what it feels like to live with this for the rest of your life. What's it like to wake up every day and realize that you were abused and preyed upon, not loved? What's that feel like? What's it feel like to look at yourself in the mirror and realize that you gave yourself to a predator willingly over and over? What's that feel like? What's it feel like to speak up and tell the truth and be abandoned by almost your entire community? What's that feel like? That's a whole other hour. <laughs> It really, really is. But I was online one day and there was a woman on there who was saying why people like me shouldn't be able to come in and talk to students. She said that it was up to parents to do that. So I jumped on there and I told her why it was important for people like me to talk to students. And she came back and she said, lady, you don't have to tell me anything. I was raped, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. And I said, I'm so sorry. How were you raped? Were you raped on a date? Maybe you were raped by a stranger. Were you raped by a family member? Maybe somebody used God to groom you and rape you. Or maybe they used fear. Or maybe like me, you were groomed with love. I said, I don't say that to be condescending to you. I say that because there are a lot of faces of rape, a lot. And if we're not willing to teach our kids about all the faces of rape, we deny them the ability to keep themselves safe. And we deny anybody listening to this webinar the ability to heal. One in four and one in six. I have people on this webinar that are survivors of sexual or domestic violence. We deny them the ability to heal. Everyone deserves to have their face of rape recognized. And everyone deserves the chance to heal. After I said what I needed to say to her, I found my friend Sarah's statement online. She was abused by her youth pastor. She put him in prison and she said, this is what it felt like to realize that she'd been abused and not loved. I hate it. I hate waking up from a dream when I can't get away from you. I hate the next few minutes where I have to convince myself this isn't happening again. I hate that you know me. I hate that you knew my body. I hate that your hands touched it and defiled it. And even after you stole my innocence, you denied it. I hate you used my heart to get to me. How do you ever trust yourself again, right? I hate that I just can't forget you or what you did to me. And I hate that sometimes I still feel like I'm betraying you by speaking up. That's how strong that loyalty is. I still feel like I'm betraying him by speaking up. You served 
56 days in jail. I've served 15 years of my life. That's what that feels like. When I started this talk, I told you that the average abuser can have up to 75 victims in their lifetime. That's one abuser and 75 victims. So who has more power? The 75, right? 75 voices to one, right? But those voices get lost in blame and shame and hatred and some of them not even knowing what happened to them because no adult stepped in to help them. So if you take anything away from this talk today, anything at all, take this. Don't be that person. Don't. Don't be that person that walks along going, have you seen what she's wearing today? Do you know how many boys she's had sex with? Did you see how much time he spends with that teacher? Don't be that person. You know why? Because I'm somebody's mom and I'm somebody's wife and I'm somebody's friend. I'm somebody's daughter. I'm somebody, I'm a human being. I didn't deserve to be treated that way. None of us did, we were just kids. And if you laugh about sexual assault and sexual abuse, or if you victim blame, or if you stay quiet while other people do in your presence, there could be somebody sitting right next to you with their own truth of abuse or assault in their guts. And they're not gonna share it with you now because you've stolen it from them. And it could be your own mom, your son, your daughter, your best friend, your spouse. Be somebody who helps. Don't be somebody who hurts. I want to close with a question a sixth grade kid asked me in Greenville, Illinois. He asked me if I'd put my abuser in prison. That is a heavy question for a sixth grade kid. I told him I wasn't able to do that, but I was able to bring a civil action against my abuser and against my school district. I did not explain all this to sixth graders, but I want to say it all to you. I'm sure all of you have heard she just wants money when somebody brings a civil action. But civil litigations are incredibly important. For most states, your, your civil action will pass much longer after your criminal action. You have more time for that. Also, civil actions hold everyone accountable. Everyone that enabled that abuse, it holds that institution accountable for those people and allowing and enabling that abuse. Trust me, if it takes a village to raise a child, it usually takes a village to abuse one. And $500 million will ensure that Michigan State never has another Larry Nassar. And if you are not going to do right by people just to do right by people, and you sacrifice them for your money, sometimes you need to be held accountable with your wallet for that. So those are very important. I did not explain all that to sixth grade kids. I just told them that I was able to bring a civil litigation against my school and my abuser. And every sixth grade kid in Greenville, Illinois stood up and clapped for me. And I was like, wow, the kids get it. What the heck's wrong with the adults, right? So this kid sat back down and he said, Mrs. Denault, are you still a pretzel? And I wasn't prepared to answer that that day. I was like, please God, don't cry in front of these kids. How many of you out there played sports? I mean, I can't see you, but in a crowd, usually when I'm doing it, there's tons. And I asked them, were you all about it? Because I was all about it. I loved being a pretzel. I did. It was unique. Nachos and cheese, we go good with these. We are the pretzels. I was their booster president for seven years. Their PTA secretary for 11. My stepdaughter from my previous marriage was in my abuser's driver's ed class. That's how much I didn't understand what had happened to me. My boys graduated from there. It's their alma mater. I'd have done anything for my community, but I'm not a pretzel anymore. I had to move away from my home because they're mad that I did this. And when I said that, a sixth grade kid in Greenville, Illinois said to me, I don't understand. Why would they be mad at you? All you did was tell the truth. <laughs> How profound, right? We teach our kids to tell the truth but when their truth is not convenient for us, we snatch it from them sometimes, don't we? So I tell students, you do not have to raise your hand to speak this truth. You have my permission.
to speak up to protect yourself or someone else. And then I leave them with these questions. Can you leave this canvas without permission? No, right. And you have to raise your hand to get permission to go to the bathroom, right? Yep. And you can take medicine at school, but mom and dad have to sign a sheet for that, right? Yep. And you can pick your classes, but mom and dad have to sign, right? Yep. Can you vote? Most of them say no. And then I say, please don't do these things because they're not good for you. But are you old enough to drink or smoke? And they go, no, they've even raised the smoking age. Right. We even have a code to teach you how to dress. We don't think you're wise enough to get yourself up, get yourself dressed, and get yourself to school in something appropriate. So if you ever hear somebody say about a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kid that an adult had sex with, they knew what they were doing. I want you to pull that out of your pocket and I want you to say, excuse me, but I had to raise my hand to get permission to take a pee when I was 15 years old. If they didn't think I was wise enough to get up and go to the bathroom without asking permission, they certainly didn't think I was wise enough to be having sex with an adult. We say that for our comfort, not for their safety. Don't ever forget that. I do not do this with students. And when I do it for a live audience, it is incredibly impactful. I guess the best way we can do it is in the chat. Can you see the chat, Danielle? Yes, yes, okay. chat is open. Please do not feel obligated to put it in the chat if you don't want to. But if I asked you if you were a widow, you would say that in there. You wouldn't be ashamed of that. If I asked you if you lost a child, you wouldn't be ashamed of that either. If I asked you if you'd survived cancer, you wouldn't just put that in the chat, but you would be screaming when you take your mic off and raise your fist in the air to tell me about the thing you survived that tried to steal your life and your security. But when we ask people if they are sexual or domestic violence survivors, that shame sometimes can still be there. One to 75. So if I have any survivors out there in the chat that would like me to acknowledge that and give them a virtual hug, in person I give people hugs or I give them fist bumps, I would love for you to put that in there so we can support you and send you a hug. And the next thing I ask people, I have those people stand and I, I'm having five to six disclosures at a time in a room of 30 people. And it changes the dynamic in a room because these are now those people, someone. It's who they eat lunch with. It's who they collaborate with. It's real to them now. And then I have those people remain standing and I ask the audience if you've ever had to make a child abuse report or if you have ever had to be on a call for child abuse or domestic violence, please stand. And then I ask, if you know or love someone who's a survivor of sexual or domestic violence, please stand. By the time I am done, almost the entire room is standing. And I explain to them that reporting child abuse is a vicarious trauma. Loving someone who's been abused is a vicarious trauma. And I ask them to look around the room and I say, look at all the trauma that's in this room. We have the power to change this. All we have to do is stop making this a taboo topic. Talk to our kids, hold space for survivors, allow them their voices, allow them to go after accountability, believe survivors. We can change the face of sexual and domestic violence. We can change how many people are standing in a room. We just have to be willing to do that. We have the power to change this for the next generation. I truly believe that. That is all I have. And I want you all to know that my next talk is not gonna be this heavy. My next talk is gonna be for girls. If women were as nice to each other outside the bathroom as they are inside the bathroom, wouldn't it be a beautiful world out there? I mean, we walk in the bathroom and we look and we go, oh my gosh, I love your shoes today. And then we find our click and we go, can you believe the shoes that hag is wearing on her feet today? Just be kind. There's no reason to be that way. Does anybody have any questions that they wanna ask? Or if you want me to throw out some I usually get to start it, I could do that too. 
while we wait for some questions to come in, we have multiple survivors in the chat. So just wanted to acknowledge that and thank everybody for, you know, sharing that with me. Let's see, we do have Hallie who's raised her hand. Let me see. I'm going to unmute you now, Hallie, if that's all right with you. Oh my gosh, I know who said that name. <laughs> all right, so you have permission to speak now, Hallie, if, if you want to unmute. Or you can just type it in the chat as well. Hey, Michelle. Great to oh see you. Oh my gosh, do not make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Happy tears, always. <laughs> yes. I have a really big question. When is your book coming out? <laughs> Everybody always asks me that. I'm working on compiling it. I, For those people out there who don't know, when I first spoke up, I trauma survivors don't ask for help. It, it doesn't matter if it's sexual trauma or any kind of trauma survivors. We just don't. We, we think we've got it, right? And I didn't know how to help myself when I first spoke up. I didn't know how to ask. So I sat down at a keyboard and I put all of my feelings on paper and put it in a private group. And I still blog to this day. And I would put down every emotion, every memory. So it's all there. And I'm glad I did it then. I'm glad I did because it, it's raw and it's real. And I'm compiling all that together right now. It will take me some time to compile it, but I'm going to name it the drama queen a story of abuse in a small town. So as soon as I can get all that to an editor and a publisher, I'm going to do that. So I promise I'm working on it. <laughs> you, you go girl. Thank you. I love you. Thanks for showing up. I do want to say there's a lot of resources out there too, that people don't always realize, especially like uh, somebody came up to me the other day, was a parent of a survivor and they hadn't found out until 10 years later that their child had been assaulted in college. And they were really struggling with that. And the reason they were struggling with it was because at the end of my in-person presentation, I do tell people I had the privilege to work with students last year. And I'm going to add that here really quick. I, I had the privilege of doing K through 12 because we were down to prevention educators when I was still with the Rape Crisis Center. And kindergartners are awesome, by the way. I, I loved it. I always ask them, what do you want to do when you grow up? And a five-year-old said, I want to be a doctor. And she goes, but when I was littler, she's five. She said, I want to be a veterinarian, but I realized I can't watch animals in pain, but I'm okay with humans being in pain. It concerned me a little, but, but I did K through 12 and I came in and I did grooming for six through 12. And then I came back and I did healthy relationships and consent like two weeks later for them. And to watch the conversations open with those two being right back to back were so cool because the kids were getting it. They're getting that some of the things we've taught them are good, can actually be used to abuse, right? Because they've seen that in the grooming component. Now we're talking about healthy relationships. And we're not just talking about romance. We're talking about friendships. People get in toxic friendships. They allow things in their life. So when I did that talk for kids, I asked them, how many of you have heard a safe adult say, well, she must like it because she keeps going back to him. And 50% of the kids in the room would raise their hand each time. 50% of kids had heard somebody blamed for getting beaten up. And then I said, how many of you have heard somebody say, well, if she wouldn't have been wearing that, one of your safe adults, or if he wouldn't have gone there. And 80% of the kids raised their hand to that. 80% of kids usually have heard a safe adult blame somebody for their sexual assault. And then I said this to them, I don't know your parents, but how many of you have heard a parent say, or a grandparent, whoever raises you, we don't have to worry about that with you though. We know you're a better kid than that. We know we've raised you better than that. You'd never get yourself in that situation. And 100% of kids usually raise their hand to that question. 100% of kids are hearing that. And then I asked them the same question I asked you. Do your parents do everything you do? And they laughed at me, just like my audience usually does. And those things don't mesh. My kid will never. And you don't know everything your kids are doing. And I told the adults in my presentation, my in-person presentation, I go, listen to me, that gives your kids a very dangerous lens. They're not looking for the flags of abuse. They think they'll never, they've been raised better than that. They'll never get themselves in that situation. I'm not gonna be that girl. And I said, I tell them, I say to kids, what happens when something bad does happen? And one presentation, I had a senior boy sitting in front of me and he looked right past me. That's how I knew. And he said, we're not gonna tell our parents because we think they'll be disappointed in us because we should have known better. I wish my mom was in here right now. 
And man, that got me in the gut as a mom because I, I did those things. And this parent came to me the other day and she goes, I said to my daughter, you're such a good girl. And because I said that, she didn't tell me for 10 years. So I tell parents, we're not trying to do anything wrong when we say those things, but we sometimes have to watch what we say because our kids don't always feel safe coming to us and we haven't even meant to make them feel unsafe. So we have to be careful. And I told this parent, there's so many resources out there too that I didn't even realize from parents of survivors because they have a lot of vicarious trauma. And I've got some resources for that that I'll send you guys at PAVE from Illinois. I'll give you those. I'm not sure if you have those from Illinois, but those are great resources to have too. Not just survivors, but parents of survivors need that. We also have a question coming in from Heather. She has had her hand raised for a while. So thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna give you the permission to talk. So whenever you're ready, you can unmute or if you'd prefer, you can always type it in the chat as well. Michelle, yes. I just wanted to say personally how thankful I am that you stood up for yourself and how much, how proud I am for you for doing that. Thank you so much. I love you. I love you. I appreciate it. You guys are gonna make me cry. <laughs> I want you all to know that two days ago, I didn't even have a voice, barely. I was in Chicago. <laughs> and I had to speak with a microphone because my voice was so bad. So I'm so glad I haven't coughed during this time because I didn't want to do that for you guys. All right. Do we have any final questions? Again, if you need any support, you can email ashley at pavingtheway.net. You could also reach out to me. My email is danyk.pavingtheway.net. <laughs> or you can always just reach out to our general email, which is info at pavingtheway.net, and you will get directed to the appropriate person at PAVE. And thank you so much, Michelle, for being with us. We love you. And thank you so much for your presentation and, you know, just standing up for survivors and using your voice to you. change. You guys have been a source of support for me, and I have been when I first got on this road and, and there's several people that I say, I'm not sure if I'd be alive. And one of them is Angela. I'm not sure if I'd be alive if it wasn't for me being able to reach out and get that support from you guys. So it means the world that you're there. And I thank you for being there for survivors like me. Thank you so much. That means so much to everybody here at PAVE. All right, well, I hope that everybody has a lovely evening. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye, everybody.